Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen Webster. I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Ascensi. So while we're changing over uh, to the slides, today I'm going to talk about connected coaching, which is a category I think emerges uh, from the success of the connected fitness category. So I'll just wait till we pull up our slides. So I think we're all familiar with the connected fitness category. We've watched it emerge over the last several, we've watched it appear and then emerge over the last several years um, at CES, starting with uh, digital communities like uh, Nike Plus, Strava, Under Armour Record. We've then seen a plethora of activity trackers and smart watches, things like Fitbit and Jawbone. And I don't think the category is showing any signs of slowing down. Uh, we're seeing companies creating billions of dollars of value with connected fitness equipment products, companies like Technogym, uh, Flywheel, and new entrants like Peloton, of course. So, my team and I are thinking about what's the opportunity in connected coaching, and connected co coaching as a category that emerges from connected fitness. And I think the opportunity we have is to be very distinct and very deliberate about what the connected coaching category actually is. So my team and I, we've all coached on the track, on the field, in the dojo, and so we decided to take a coach first and a sports first approach to thinking about the category, why does it keep going to that video? Uh, rather, than, uh, rather than taking a, a technology first approach. So we thought about what are, the, what are the ideas, what are the accountabilities that on the field or in the dojo or on the track that we would make to our athletes and how do we scale those accountabilities digitally um, as we, uh, as we move to connected coaching. Are we okay over here? Great. So, the video seems really keen to play. So, I'm gonna talk about these, uh, some of these ideas. I don't have time to talk about them all, but what I'd like to do to start is to put all of these ideas into a single context and just spend 60 seconds introducing you to the company we've been building and the product we've been building for the last four years. I would like you to meet Ascensi. Today, let's focus purely on form. Face the bag with chin down and hands up. Straighten your leg and lift your heart. Meet a sensei, your personal trainer who knows your every move. Keep your chin up and eyes to the horizon. Nice, that's good form. With sensors throughout your clothing, she tracks your posture and movement and gives you feedback on form and progress, all delivered in real time in your ear. Your handwork is improving. Now let's add a roundhouse. She is trained by experts to help you excel. Drive more with your legs. You will feel less strain on your arms. Much better. You got this. Engage your core and lengthen your spine. Nice. Now into Cobra. You've done this better. Pivot faster with your right foot. Good. Again. That's not a mistake in the video, relax. You can watch the rest of that video online at Ascensi.com, but I just wanted to let you see uh, how we're thinking about this connected coaching category. So I said I would talk about some of these ideas. I'm gonna talk about these three, so in the interest of time, I'll just dive in and let me start with the notion of missing nothing and seeing everything. So motion capture is a technology that's been available to elite athletes, Olympic professional athletes for, for quite some time, notably around the, or starting around the Sydney Olympics. Here you see US hurdler Lolo Jones uh, using motion capture to find those marginal gains that would help her qualify for London 2012. So if an elite coach can use motion capture to help an elite athlete find those hundreds and those tenths of a second, find those marginal gains. It stands to reason to us that if we can consumerize a motion capture technology, those same elite coaches uh, can coach people like you and I and help us find the gains that we need to acquire the techniques and the skills to improve in the sports of our choosing. 
So my team and I, essentially, that was the first problem we tackled, is how can we consumerize motion capture and how can we replace these reflective markers designed to be picked up by a camera with sensors that can be infused in textile and give us motion capture in apparel of your choosing. It's a technology we license to apparel manufacturers. We don't want to be in the business of making uh, our own apparel. So it's a technology we call kinetic capture, and it essentially allows us to look at an athlete hundreds of times a second, frame by frame. And so it means what we're looking at is posture and movement and timing and form and all of the inputs for good technique, where good technique is what drives the outputs, is what drives the numbers. Now, we've decided to choose rowing uh, as the sport that we're going to market with first, and we're very fortunate to have three times world champion and two times Olympic gold medalist, Helen Glover, uh, as one of the members of our board of advisors. And Helen gave a fantastic talk at University of, of Oxford recently uh, and talked about some of the things she'd learned over the last two Olympiads. And so today I'm gonna play you a couple of sound bites uh, from that talk, because I'd rather you heard from Helen than heard from me. So first, uh, let's listen to what Helen has to say about how hard it is to train by yourself and the importance of technique because it is so hard to train on your own but it gives you the opportunity to do what's best for you and I would say time invested in technique is time really really well spent so for me if the other girls were doing in, the other girls in my training group were doing maybe a 12k row and I didn't have that time I had to rush off to school I would do a 6k row and spend the rest of the time working on my technique. Um, I think that pays huge dividends, especially if you're fairly new to a, sp new to a sport. Um, you, can, you can line up on the start line with somebody as fit as you, and you can, you can beat them by length if your technique is better. I think we heard this from some of the other speakers today. There are many activities where it's not just about how big your engine is, it's not just about your endurance, it's how good is your technique and how much does that differentiate the person that comes first from the person that comes eighth. And so I mentioned at the beginning that you know, we want to be really distinct and deliberate in how we separate connected fitness and connected coaching categories. And I'm not suggesting for a second uh, that uh, connected fitness is dead, long live connected coaching, but rather how does this category emerge? So in, con in connected fitness, and we've heard this a lot today and we've heard this a lot for some years, uh, we focus a lot on biometrics, our heart rate, our heart rate variability, our VO2 max, our hydration, our lactate levels. But I think for connected coaching, we need to be able to see the athlete the way a coach sees the athlete, not inferring posture and form from biometrics, but actually observing the biomechanics of the athlete. And what that means is it's no longer um, possible to just use a single sensor on our uh, hip or on our wrist to get that full 360 degree picture of what the athlete is doing. Um, an activity tracker is good at guessing the difference between walking and running and swimming and cycling, but can't possibly see the nuance of technique that a coach would be looking for if you spent an hour or two training with them. And so, as we've seen today from you know, companies like Mind, et cetera, we really see this trend uh, towards sensors being infused in smart apparel so that we can deliver those kind of experiences. But I think the one thing I would talk about in terms of missing nothing and seeing everything is to date there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, focus on measuring the outputs, measuring the efforts. We talk about how many calories did we burn, how many steps did we take, um, what were the number of reps that we did. So we really look at the numbers that tell us that the effort that we put in. In connected coaching, I think it becomes more important that we start measuring the effort that's going in. What's the technique, what's the skill, what's the consistency, what's the accuracy? And someone raised that question on the panel. I wish I'd been on the panel to answer. Uh, someone asked that question about how do you measure uh, technique? And that's certainly something we've been waking up and thinking about uh, every single day for quite some time now. So if you see something, you should say something, right? We've all heard that phrase before. So if kinetic capture is the technology that allows us to observe an athlete, how do, we, how do we then take those observations and translate them into the coaching that that athlete needs in that moment? And when I say in that moment, sometimes you want to tell the coach after practice, sorry, sometimes you want to tell the athlete 
after practice or just before their, their next practice. I saw this, I now want us to think about working on the next thing. But as importantly, if you're teaching technique and skill, there's a proximity, there, there's a value in proximity. The closer to the mistake you tell the athlete they made that mistake and correct it, the more likely they're gonna lay down that myelin sheath and build that muscle memory and, and fix that mistake. So we talk about this as finding the right words and finding the right words might be, are we using the right coaching cues? Are we helping push an athlete through a plateau? If I see you doing, if, if I'm teaching you a technique and you're not doing it correctly, it's finding a way to break that technique apart, teach the individual parts, and then help you put it back together again, the whole part, whole method of coaching. So that's what we think about when we talk about finding the right words. Now, Helen, who I introduced earlier, talks fondly of uh, her, her Olympic coach, a fantastic coach called Robin Williams. And I, I want to listen to, to, to uh, what Helen has to say about Robin and about finding the right words. And our coach, Robin, was was amazing at that. So Robin is, if you think of Robin, you kind of don't really think of him as a coach. You think of him as more of an artist. He's so, you know, he kind of conjures up an image of rowing, which if you walk past him having a conversation, you wouldn't even know he was talking about rowing. He's so descriptive in his language. Um, and we used to get, people used to take the mickey out of us quite a lot because we would be talking about things about like, pole vaulting past the catch and and um, you know the, the boys always used to laugh at us but I do remember one particular particular session where we had done well and we had beaten the boys on one of the pieces and they came up and they said oh how did you do this and we said well you know we were, we were putting our blade in past the white picket fence and pushing it past the uh and they were like what <laughs> oh right yeah I get it so, so the way he the way he describes kind of the stroke is is kind of really really unique so I think in any of the times that we plateaued he would suddenly turn around and describe it a totally different way. And he would sort of try something totally different. And next thing you know, we were kind of doing pauses in the boat with him throwing tennis balls at us and trying to catch it. So a lot of it was about refreshing and changing things up every time it was a little bit stale. So Steph Curry wasn't the first person to catch tennis balls while playing another sport. Um, so I, I love the phrase Helen used right at the be beginning there, that she thinks, of her Robin, uh, she thinks of her coach Robin as much as an artist. And I think that reflects something Munir said earlier, that when you can bring the science and the art of coaching together, that's when you're playing in an intersection where you can really do things well. So again, as we think about finding the right words and the difference that means between connected fitness and connected coaching, um, if you see me talk at other events, you'll probably hear me say, just like you're about to, uh, coaching isn't counting and cheering, and teaching isn't tracking. Not that those things are wrong, they're necessary but not sufficient if you want to coach improvement in an athlete. So in connected fitness, we spend a lot of time counting. One more minute to go, or just, you know, turn your cadence up to 80 or you know, you know, whatever. We, we, we think about split times, we think about metrics and counting sets and counting reps. And connected coaching, it's about cues. It's about telling the athlete things like, open your back a little earlier, or remember, it's like you're elbowing somebody behind you. We're delivering external coaching cues that can actually help the athlete anchor technique. And while it's great to encourage someone, here comes a hill, let's really dig in and give it a push, that doesn't tell them how to dig in and how to give that push. So it's incumbent on us to think about how can we educate the athlete and how can we actually tell them to do the things that we're going to ask them to do through encouragement. So uh, nuance, but important nuance between uh, fitness and coaching, I think. Now the last thing I want to talk about is coaches watching athletes. Doesn't sound like a, a crazy idea, but as soon as we introduce a screen into the equation, we kind of went a little crazy and decided we need athletes to watch coaches. How many people recognize or even own this video that's up on screen right now? Go ahead and aid yourselves. This is, uh, this is the, <laughs> just Mary Lou? I don't believe that. Um, so um, this is the, the original Jane Fonda workout video. And it's, uh, you know, the, the formula hasn't changed. 30 years on, we still put the coach on screen doing, doing in real time what they're telling us to do, talking through it, a couple of students of various abilities in the background. I think even the fake New York loft windows are still in things like Nike Training Club. Uh, th those haven't changed over 30 years either. Um, but what we're doing here is we're, we're asking the athlete to now imitate the coach and self-assess whether they're doing things correctly. It doesn't get harder if they're accomplished. It doesn't get easier if they're having trouble. 
Now, I'm not saying that video and coaching isn't important. We're betting the business on it, but we need to shift in coaching to the role of video being in educating and then thinking about how AI can guide us. So what I'm about to show you is from the Ascensi product. It's one of our rowing coaches teaching a rowing drill. So if your stroke is poor in the second part of the stroke, as you go back to the beginning of the rowing machine, it's a very common drill that coaches will use. And you'll hear Johan establish cues, keep your legs flat, open the back as if you're elbowing someone behind you. All right, everybody turn and watch me. One of the best <laughs> pieces of advice a coach gave me is good form is free speed. I'm going to give you guys some good form. So we're going to start off by doing a drill. It's called the pause and finish drill. Let's grab onto the handle. We're going to sit here. This is called the finish position. First thing, let's just notice legs should be flat, shoulders are down, elbows are back, almost as if you're going to elbow somebody behind you. First thing we're going to do is have our arms go So I'm just going to talk as this is playing now, just in the interest of time. So you're seeing, Johan, legs are flat, open the back, shoulders are down, elbows as if you're hitting somebody behind you. And then he's talking you through that drill. He's telling you to put your arms away. Then once your arms are away, then the coach says, now your body can go over. Once your body is tilted over, then he says, and roll. And then you're allowed to do the stroke. He's breaking the stroke apart and putting it back together again. So what I'm just about to show you is uh, one of my team, Bill, being taken through this drill by Asensi. He's wearing kinetic capture. She's not speaking until she sees him make the correct movement. And what she says depends on what she sees. So let's take a look at Bill uh, doing this drill with Asensi. Off of the foot plates. Single stroke, arms away, body over, and roll. Arms away. So once his arms go away, and then she'll say body over. The next one, he'll pause the body over. Body over. And roll. So you can see we're observing his posture, we're observing his form, and using that to drive the real-time coaching experience. So whenever we see an athlete in a 2K test or a 500-meter race and we observe that they're rushing at the finish and they're, they're not organizing themselves correctly for the next stroke, we can introduce this drill into their practice. In that 30-minute practice, we don't have to wait until next week and change the programming. We'll make that an act of recovery or make that an act of rest or make that a part of technique coaching. Oops. So I was sat around. One last Helen. So uh, I, I want to finish with Helen. She, I, I heard her say something on television, actually. I was like, Helen, could you just record that for me? So this is Helen in her living room pointing her iPhone at herself. Um, but I'll just let you listen to this, and then I'll finish. So I was sat around on a training camp, and I was probably a little bit bored. <laughs> but I decided to work out how many practice strokes we take in training. And I worked out that in an Olympic cycle, I take about 4 million practice strokes which means that when we get to an Olympic final, for every single stroke, I've taken well over 16,000 practice strokes. And I think for me that really highlighted the importance of the quality of that practice. It's not just being out there and it's not just taking those strokes, it's making sure I'm doing the right thing and I'm having the right learning during training um, to make sure I'm ready to perform each one of those single strokes that are so important in the Olympic final. So just think about that, two million, so every stroke she takes in that Olympic final, there were 16,000 strokes in practice. And uh, there's a phrase that we used when we were venture pitching the company at the very beginning, is practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. It's an overused cliche that we've all heard before. But that's what I think the opportunity is in connected coaching. There are many of us uh, doing great jobs, instrumenting athletes as they're playing their game. Coach John Wooden talked about the difference between practice and scrimmage. I think we've spent a lot of time in the industry focusing on scrimmage and now's the opportunity to watch those 16,000 strokes, to uh, observe, guide, monitor and improve athletes in the sport of their choosing. Rowing is just the beginning for us um, as, we, as we monitor and guide their practice. So um, I'll post these slides on Twitter so you can follow us at Asensi or follow the hashtag Connected Coaching. Um, and I'd love to continue. We're just starting this conversation. I'd love to continue it with you. Um, feel free to sign up at sensi.com uh, and you guys can be some of the first people to train uh, with Olympic class coaches um, in different disciplines. And most importantly, I think we heard this from some of the other companies, we'll get to the future faster together. So if you make apparel, if you make connected fitness equipment, if you're in the business of bricks and mortar or digital coaching, uh, we'd love to have a conversation with you as well. So thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.